Well, I want to welcome everybody in to today's virtual speaker session presented by the Penn State Alumni Association. I see the Zoom room filling up now over 40 participants. We have over 100 registered for today's webinar, webinar, and we're excited to see so many familiar names. Go ahead and let us know who you are and where you're from and uh, your Penn State class year in the chat box. We'd love to see who was with us today. We have a great presentation lined up for you. Jason Beal is with us from Shavers Creek, and we will be talking about all the great work that they are doing out there at Shavers Creek. Again, welcome to the Penn State Alumni Association's virtual speaker session. We'll be getting started in just a couple minutes. Good to see you, Peggy Glazer, a familiar face now on, or a familiar name at least, on our virtual speaker session, Marsha from the class of 75 and 78, all the way in Los Angeles, California. Good to see you. Jim Wyland, class of 97, right here in State College. Joe Shabala in Huntington. A fellow DDAR colleague. I see Chaz Salkin from Dover, Delaware. Amy Elliott. Welcome today to today's virtual speaker session. Heather Carlson from Bradford, a freshman recreation and parks major. Getting ready to get started here at Penn State as the fall semester will begin in just about a week. Representatives from Cape Cod, I see Paul and Peter from the class of 98. Peter Sheridan is a regular on the virtual speaker sessions as well. Parks and Rec majors are represented today with Michelle Moore, class of 85. And I see Allison from Narbeth, Pennsylvania, class of 05 and 2011. Welcome in. We will be getting started in just a minute. Again, I wanna welcome everybody in. I see the Zoom room is filling up here, over 50 participants. Some of you may have noticed that you got multiple reminders of today's session. We apologize for that. We had a little glitch with our system. We did not intend to send you four and five reminders, but we are so glad that some of you remembered to show up and Hear today's presentation, which we'll be getting started in just a couple minutes. I see Dennis Seidel, Dennis Seibel from the class of 93 and Laurel uh, down in Howard County, Maryland. Uh, Thomas Smith from the class of 89 in West Michigan. I see Amber Redmond. Good to see you, Amber, from the class of 2009 and 2018. Brendan Wallace checking in from Westchester County, New York. Good afternoon, everybody. Where else would you rather be than a Zoom full of Penn Staters? I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association, and I'd like to welcome everybody to today's virtual speaker session, which, as a reminder, is being recorded. Today, we welcome Jason Beal, Jason Beal a Penn State graduate, who'll take us behind the scenes at Penn State's Nature Center at Shavers Creek. Today's discussion is the latest installment in a recurring series of virtual programming that the Alumni Association is bringing to the Penn State community. We'll be speaking with experts and university leaders who will share insight and perspective with you in the coming weeks and months. Additionally, the Alumni Association offers online networking events, career programs, and webinars, and you can see the full list of all of our programs on our website at alumni.psu.edu slash events. Now I'm happy to welcome Jason Beal, a lifelong conservationist to the virtual speaker session. In his two decade career, he has directed a nature center and preserve, led land acquisition and habitat stewardship initiatives, engaged in environmental advocacy and developed wildlife con conservation programs. He currently directs 
Shavers Creek Animal Care Program focusing on Penn State students career development through the center's zoo, which features Pennsylvania amphibians, reptiles, and raptors. A 1999 graduate of Penn State, Jason lives near State College with his family. Jason will lead a virtual tour that will highlight the animal care program at Penn State's Nature, she Nature Center at Shavers Creek. The center just underwent a $7.5 million expansion in 20, from 2016 to 2019, including a complete redesign of the center's zoo and related programming. Jason will share how students in the community, both local and virtual, can engage with the center's wildlife education and conservation initiatives. Thank you, Jason, for joining us, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Welcome. Great. Thank you, Paul. Really appreciate being here. It's exciting to see all the names on there. Some I recognize a lot of folks from Recreation Park Tourism Management, which has had a long-standing relationship with Shavers Creek. So I'm going to go ahead and get started here, share my screen, and uh, let's go ahead and get rolling. Okay. if I can get my slides to go. There we go. Uh, so Shavers Creek Environmental Center is uh, part of Penn State Outreach and Online Education. And uh, we have been part of the university since 1976 uh, when we formed over in the Stone Valley Recreation Area. And uh, it's been a longstanding relationship with the university. Um, we've formed a community nature center and engaged in environmental education and outdoor recreation and really has been a great place for the community uh, to come. You'll see there that our mission is uh, really extending outreaches, uh, mission of instruction, service, and research. And so with the Nature Center, with our trails, we do that on site. Uh, we conduct research. Uh, we also conduct a lot of academic classes, as well as provide a lot of the educational opportunities people expect from a Nature Center, such as summer camps and school programs. Uh, so today we're going to focus primarily on the animal care program and how it relates to our emerging professionals, which is the term we use at Shavers Creek for our student volunteers or interns or even wage employees. And I have my helper here, uh, Samara, to come visit me today. Um, so with the animal care program, you can see we connect people to people and people to nature, which is Shavers Creek's motto. And there's a couple of our students that we've worked with. Uh, that's Graham Gorgas, who is a uh, former intern and Penn State student. Um, and uh, he is now off working with amphibious reptiles elsewhere. And to share a little bit about the program, I'm going to turn it over to uh, uh, some of my staff, wonderful group of people I get to work with, including Joe, who you'll see in a moment. Joe was also a former student, uh, both at Penn State Du Bois, as well as in the Wildlife Fishery Science Program. Uh, Joe was a volunteer at Shavers Creek and now came back to lead our amphibian reptile program. And so here's a little overview about what we do. Hi, my name is Jason Beal. Welcome to Shavers Creek Environmental Center. I'm the program director for the Animal Care Program. We are Penn State's native wildlife zoo. We feature amphibians, reptiles, and raptors. Hi, my name is Abby. I am the raptor program coordinator here at Shavers Creek. We work with a variety of species of eagles, hawks, owls, vultures. So our job as caretakers of these animals and trainers of these animals is to make sure that they're really prepared to do their job of educating the public. When folks come in to visit the raptors, we want them to be able to see a vulture in the way that they would behave in the wild. And we want them to see what a hawk would look like perched in a tree naturally. Another way that we serve the Shavers Creek community is by allowing students from a variety of different backgrounds and places to come and experience that themselves. The career of working with animals and around animals with wildlife in any capacity really requires a level of experience that is difficult to get unless you're able to find the right place. Live animals are the reason that I care about the environment. They're the reason that I watch what I do in my actions, and I want to be able to share that with others, and I want others to have the same experiences that I had. My name's Joe. I'm the Amphibian and Reptile Program Coordinator here at Shavers Creek Environmental Center. And so I oversee the amphibians and reptiles, which are collectively known as herps. Unlike raptors, reptiles and amphibians are ectothermic or cold-blooded, which means that they have to regulate their body temperature using external temperatures around them. 
We try and provide them as wide a range in those temperatures as we can. We also try and provide them with different opportunities to exercise. So for a turtle, that may mean climbing over uh, logs or other obstacles in their enclosures to really help build their muscles in that capacity. These animals are here as ambassadors for their species. And there's a lot we can learn about them, natural history-wise, how they use their environment, how they use their habitats, and most importantly, what we can do to help protect them. Uh, these animals may be here because of disabilities they've received related to uh, human causes. Those could include car collisions or unintentional lead poisoning. And so one of the things we want to do is have people form a connection with these animals, make a connection with the species, and think about their place in the environment and how they can help promote and conserve biodiversity. One of the exciting things we had the opportunity to do here during our redesign was really reimagine what our animal care program could look like and where these animals live their lives. And so one of the primary things that we learned is we want to make sure our animals have as much choice and control as they can over their lives. By giving them extra perching options or extra basking options, it allows them to move around and engage in behaviors that we might not normally see. And that allows for new educational opportunities for visitors, uh, for us to make that connection with the animal, with their species, and with the habitats in Pennsylvania that sustain them. We want to work with our birds to make sure that they're comfortable and engaged in taking care of themselves and exhibiting these natural behaviors. Enrichment can be really any type of items or things that we can provide to the animals that allow them to engage in natural behaviors. So in the case of a raptor, that might mean ripping and tearing. In the case of a turtle, it might mean swimming or turning their head sideways to take a bite of some food. And if you can't make it out to Shavers Creek, there's still ways to get involved. You can go online to www.shaverscreek.org and check out our honorary animal caretaker program and sponsor the daily care of one of our animals for a month or for the entire year. Traditionally, amphibians and reptiles are considered sedentary at best and scary at worst. And we at Shavers Creek are trying to challenge that mindset. Um, there's something very different about looking in the eyes of an animal. Being able to have that interaction creates an emotional connection that really sticks with people no matter what age they are. And so you can see that I'm very fortunate to work with a great team of both humans, uh, but also amphibians, uh, reptiles, and raptors. And so to share a little bit uh, more again about what we do primarily in the animal care program, uh, we operate a free zoo, which uh, promotes uh, conservation of Pennsylvania amphibians, reptiles, and raptors. And that's really important to us uh, to be open to the community, to be uh, for anybody really to come in and take advantage of that. Uh, we're also very interested in working with different populations to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to see uh, and experience some of the wildlife that makes Pennsylvania such a fascinating place. Uh, and as a lot was mentioned in that video, emerging professionals, uh, getting them set up so when they leave Penn State or even Juniata College now where we get a lot of volunteers from, uh, they have not only the academic knowledge, but they have that experiential education and also that workplace experience. It's going to prepare them for that career and hopefully give them a leg up. Uh, we want to make sure that everything we do is evidence-based, which means that the program has to constantly be evolving. And so that leads to um, teaching academic classes and supporting research projects. We wanna make sure that the most up-to-date information is what we're sharing with our students to make sure that uh, we're serving them as best we can. And then related to all of this is we represent Shavers Creek and Penn State in the animal care field on an international scale. Uh, when we prepared for our redesign process, we interviewed dozens of facilities around the world uh, to find out what what they did and how we could improve our program. And now we're returning that favor. We've been advising over two dozen facilities uh, from Aruba uh, to Alaska and everywhere in between. It's been a very exciting opportunity to share uh, the Shavers Creek experience and, and what we do at Penn State. And so there's three main parts of the animal care program we'll look at, uh, uh, which is the Litzinger Herpetarium, where our amphibians and reptiles uh, live. And uh, that was donated by uh, Tom and Mary Litzinger, Mary Ellen Litzinger, uh, wonderful donors and supporters of Shavers Creek for many long years. Uh, the aviary, which is where our raptors reside. And then of course, the emerging professional training program. We'll meet one of the students who has um, gone on to spread his wings elsewhere. And so I start with this picture of the Litzinger Herpetarium uh, with our venomous snakes. This is actually the first thing that people see when they come in, and that's intentional. We want people to get a reaction. We wanna provoke some conversation and some thought. Uh, snakes, obviously, uh, people have very strong feelings of them. Venomous snakes in particular, people can have stronger uh, feelings. And so these animals we really consider unhuggables. They're animals that might have a reputation that maybe is misleading or doesn't share everything that's fascinating about their lifestyle. So we really have the opportunity to change that narrative 
uh, share some evidence-based experience with these animals and show them in a new light, which will hopefully lead to their conservation. Uh, along the theme of inhuggles, uh, we also uh, work with uh, some amphibians. You're gonna meet one here in just a moment. But all these animals uh, have some kind of conservation theme. So for our rattlesnakes, for our copperhead, and our raptors, it's ridgetop conservation. It's where the raptors migrate. It's where these venomous snakes have their hibernacula. But uh, with amphibians and reptiles, a major focus of us is also watershed stewardship. And there's really no other animal uh, better place to talk about watershed stewardship at Shavers Creek uh, than our eastern hellbender. Hello, my name is Joe, and I'm the Amphibian and Reptile Program Coordinator at Shavers Creek Environmental Center. And today I'd like to talk to you all about the Eastern Hellbender. It's actually the third largest salamander species in the world. They can grow over two feet in length. The Hellbender gets its name from its unusual appearance. Many people were initially fearful of this animal and gave it a name that represented that. So specifically, our Hellbender is named Suga, and we gave him that name because it's the genus of the Eastern Hemlock which is the state tree of Pennsylvania. And as of last year, the Eastern Hellbender is the state amphibian of Pennsylvania. So in the wild, Eastern Hellbenders are found in fast moving streams and shaded rivers. Because of that, having an Eastern Hellbender in our care is one of the more challenging species we work with. Replicating these cool mountain streams requires us to maintain colder water temperatures, faster flowing water, as well as proper lighting. So many people are unaware that the Eastern Hellbender exists in Pennsylvania, which was one of the initiatives of trying to make it our state amphibian. One of the initiatives of Shavers Creek is to have one present for the public to view and just bring awareness for that species. In other parts of their range, they are feared and often misunderstood. And that is something that we would like to try to limit as much as possible here in Pennsylvania. Eastern hellbenders specialize in eating crayfish and having them present in the stream helps to balance those population numbers and keep the stream healthy. Our state tree, the Eastern hemlock, is a species that's also being affected by climate change. As the area starts to warm, we're seeing more pest species such as the hemlock woolly adelgid moving north, and that species can decimate hemlock forests. And with the hellbender being a cold water species, as these hemlocks start to decrease, they no longer shade the streams, and those streams can become warmer and make it difficult for hellbenders to call those streams home. The eastern hellbender is just very different from all the other animals here at Shavers Creek and being able to work with that animal and really understand how it behaves in our care is helpful for understanding how it may behave in the wild and vice versa. If you'd like more information on Eastern Hellbenders and how you can help them, check out shaverscreek.org as well as paherps.com. Once again, uh, Joe is one of our emerging professionals who now uh, works full time at Shavers Creek and has really done an amazing job of now taking the training which we do with our raptors and extending that to our amphibians and reptiles. He's now working with a professor at Franklin and Marshall University uh, on some research about improving the welfare of our venomous snakes through positive reinforcement training. So it's really exciting uh, where uh, our staff has helped to take this uh, program. So now we'll head up to the aviary. And uh, the aviary uh, is harkens back to 1981 when uh, Shavers Creek bought, brought in our first bird, a red-tailed hawk named Beauty. And this has now expanded to 15 uh, different birds uh, in 14 different enclosures. And um, what I'm gonna do now is uh, turn over uh, a little bit of the aviary to Abby Flanders. Abby is our Raptor Program Coordinator. Uh, she's also a certified teacher and took that teaching knowledge and that mythology methodology and put it into the development of our emerging professional program. And so she has a very regimented module-based uh, program, which is perfect for bringing the students along in small approximations as they learn how to work in the animal care field and has actually led to uh, the creation of an academic class with Juniata College. This is Matilda. She is one of our resident raptors at Shavers Creek. She is a black vulture. Black vultures are one of the more common types of vultures in North America alongside turkey vultures. Now black vultures are kind of a fun species and Matilda is a really great example of the personality that a black vulture has. She's very eager to train. She's very engaged with 
people, both visitors and trainers. She's very eager to solve problems and figure things out in the form of enrichment. Now that's very representative of what black vultures are like in the wild. So you can kind of take a look at the way she's built. She has those flat feet. She has a very long beak. Those of us who work with vultures really have a special place in our hearts for them, partially because of their personalities, but also because they're kind of ecosystem heroes. Black vultures are very resilient to climate change and the changes in their environment. And over the last 35 years, their range has been expanding up into North America. And that's something kind of surprising in the world of looking at climate change and how that affects different species. Now, something that you can actually do with that information, other than being more familiar with the native wildlife, is to be able to input this into citizen science projects like eBird. So this allows us to track how many birds are in different areas, and it allows scientists to track the movement of different birds and where they're sighted most often. We all like to say that all of the birds are our favorites to work with and all of the animals are our favorites to work with, but Matilda definitely has a special place in a lot of our hearts. We really like to see the growth that she's shown us over the couple of years that we've worked on positive reinforcement training with her. And one of our most exciting moments was actually bringing her outside on walks for the first time ever. She's able to walk next to us and it gives her the opportunity to move around and really explore the environment in a way that she hasn't been able to previously. To learn more about these birds, visit allaboutbirds.org. To learn more about the birds at Shavers Creek, visit shaverscreek.org. And so I think right there, you can certainly see in these last couple of videos, uh, the passion uh, that uh, the staff at Shavers Creek have. And that's not just in the animal care program, that's really in everything we do. And that's uh, what attracts so many students and people to Shavers Creek is the opportunity to have these positive experiences in the outdoors or related to the outdoors. And once again, give those people uh, their next step. And so let's take a look at uh, one of those individuals right now. Uh, and so we're gonna highlight Josh Senko here. You can see Josh, he was uh, Penn State uh, Du Bois alumni. Uh, he actually came to uh, Shavers, or, um, sorry, Penn State as a wildlife and fishery science major, which he graduated as. And during that time at University Park, he volunteered at Shavers Creek as part of our work study program. And uh, it was very exciting to have Josh with us and see him grow and develop. He was there as we were redesigning our program, redesigning our facilities. And kind of the culmination of that was in 2019, we presented at the International Association of Avian, Aid, uh, Avian Trainers and Educators Conference in Orlando, Florida. And we took home the High Flyer Award for best paper about the redesign. And Josh, who now works at Alaska, was present there. We're able to share that with him, as well as Abby, you can see in the left, and Shannon David out, one of our shift leaders. And so this is really uh, ultimately the why of what we do. Uh, we have a lot of great things going on at Shavers Creek. Anybody can come in and enjoy a nice walk in the woods or see the animals take part in the program. But we're really developing and preparing people to take these Penn State experiences, to take these Shaver Creek experiences out into the world and help to uh, continue that tradition of excellence and outreach. And so uh, I'd be remiss here toward the end of the program to uh, mention there are some opportunities you can get involved. And one of them is to become an honorary animal caretaker. It costs a lot of money, a lot of time to take care of our animals. And so here's a little bit about how you can get involved and help support their daily care. Hi, my name is Abby and I'm the aviary program coordinator at Shavers Creek. This winter we'll have the opportunity to support the ambassador animals like Alula here who live at Shavers Creek. For more information about sponsoring an animal, visit shaverscreek.org to learn more about becoming an honorary animal caretaker. And so once again, shaverscreek.org, you can find out about the animal or honorary animal caretaker program there. Uh, we'll also have information about our reopening and any uh, COVID situations, uh, how we're addressing those. Uh, but the other thing that we're doing is we are also still in the process of fundraising for our aviaries. We have a number of naming opportunities. Uh, we've had President and Molly Barron uh, name some of our owl enclosures. Uh, Pam and Keith Driftmeyer. Pam is the director of PACE, a professional and community uh, engagement with outreach, uh, also named our bald eagle enclosure. So we have a lot of great opportunities if you're interested in supporting more. And with that, I will uh, turn it over back to Paul for the question and answer segment. Excellent. Thank you, Jason, for that presentation. I'm going to invite people to drop your questions in the Q&A tab down in the bottom of Zoom. Uh, 
but let's go, maybe Jason, maybe we should just start with uh, introducing the uh, the animal that is that is on screen with you today. Yeah, that is Samara. Samara is uh, one of our cats. He's uh, 15 years old. Our cats are named after a botanical fruiting structure. So Samara are the wing seeds of uh, maple trees and ash trees that you see uh, helicoptering around. And our other smaller cat is Catkin, and you'll find those on birches and alders. Yeah. So talk a little bit about what some of the greatest threats are to uh, to the animals that you house at Shavers Creek, whether it's the the raptors or the reptiles or or the snakes or amphibians. Uh, is it is it development? Is it uh, is it global warming or climate change? What is uh, the biggest threat to wildlife right now? Well, in an ecological sense, it's usually a combination of all of the above. But uh, one of the things that we're increasingly aware of is the importance of habitat, habitat connectivity or wildlife corridors. Uh, some of those are natural, such as our ridge tops. Uh, raptors migrate uh, hundreds, uh, hundreds of miles, perhaps, on their spring and fall migrations. Um, but rivers can also be important migratory areas, especially for fish like shad. Uh, but even in a terrestrial sense, just having uh, forest blocks that are large and intact uh, service quarters as well. And so that really relates to climate change as well, because as animals need to migrate and move and colonize new habitats, as the landscape changes, they need uh, those areas for safe transportation. And uh, Pennsylvania, I think, is now the leading uh, state in the country for vehicle wildlife car collisions. And unfortunately, uh, a number of the animals that live with us, our raptors in particular, are with us because of disabilities that they received in a car collision. And so I would say habitat connectivity is probably right at the top of the list. So I thought it was interesting that both you and Abby describe uh, your animals as ambassadors. Uh, is, is that for us to assume that certainly they play an education component to those who visit Shavers Creek, but um, is it also safe to assume that we are not reintroducing the animals at Shavers Creek back into the wild? Yes, uh, we are uh, strictly an education facility. We actually were involved in uh, rehabilitation up into 1995, uh, but we felt it was a better mission fit to focus on the educational aspect and the student development side of it. And so uh, we use the term ambassadors because uh, you know, obviously an ambassador is doing a good job. They are representing uh, something bigger than themselves. And so for our animals, they're representing the species and that unhuggable concept I mentioned. A lot of people don't have a positive image of vultures, but when they see Matilda and watching her choose and make decisions, and very often people will describe her as dog-like in the way that she acts and responds and checks things out, uh, it really changes their perception about her and then makes them think differently about black vultures. And really that gives us the opportunity then to hopefully extend that conversation and that behavior into something like our citizen science program where they can go count hawks or um, amphibians or reptiles in Pennsylvania. So I'm, I'm struck by uh, the work that you all do when you talk about animal and wildlife conservation uh, and how that can't necessarily happen in and of itself, right? The interdependency between um, not only uh, uh, wildlife conservation, but environmental conservation, land conservation. Can you talk a little bit about how that's integrated into the, um, into the education process for your students, that it's not just animal conservation, but it's really conservation, period? Yeah, uh, I think in, in my career, it's something I've really uh, made an effort to be involved in as many different aspects of conservation as I can. And I think that's one of the unique opportunities we have at Shavers Creek is we are such a large center. Uh, we have uh, almost 30 full-time staff as well as dozens of support staff and many volunteers. And that allows us to get involved and in, in work in a variety of different areas, whether it's Appalachian ethnobotany or fifth grade residential education uh, or team building. Uh, so if we get somebody in our animal care program or in our outdoor school, very often they are taking classes or participate in other programs. And once again, uh, they're becoming a well-rounded individual. So once they leave Shavers Creek, they have some really good practical skills, but hopefully an understanding of the big picture and how all this fits together uh, in conservation and, and education. Absolutely. We have somebody uh, asking if we could show the environmental center. Uh, and so why don't I let you um, describe the environmental center while I try to pull up some pictures here to show um, to show what the new environmental center looks like. 
Sure. Thanks for uh, getting me off the spot from a tech tech uh, situation. Uh, yeah, so Shavers Creek uh, is uh, was traditionally a forestry lodge from the Civilian Conservation Corps uh, in the 1930s and a pretty small uh, brown and uh, rock uh, building. And in 2016, we had the opportunity to expand it and we really needed to expand it just to meet our current capacity. Uh, once again, with almost 30 staff as, as well as dozens of support staff and then uh, hosting classes, whether it was uh, academic or uh, field trips from elementary schools, we need teaching spaces. Um, and once again, for the community, we want this to be a place that people choose to come and connect with nature and relax. And so as you look at these buildings here, you'll see um, we've really kind of maintained that uh, motif from the 1930s forestry camp. Uh, a lot of stone, we used a lot of, uh, that's the original camp right there, that dark brown building. And uh, when we built the new building, we focused on really sustainable resource use. Unfortunately, we're use, losing a lot of our uh, ash trees to emerald ash borer, as well as our hemlocks to woolly adelgid, as Joe mentioned in the Hellbender video. Uh, we were able to harvest that locally from Penn State's Stone Valley Forest, uh, mill it on site, and uh, once again, give us that, that look of that interface between uh, the wild and the natural world. And really, that's very symbolic of what Shavers Creek does. We want to be a welcoming place for anybody and give them that opportunity wherever they are in their uh, nature journey, so to speak, to connect with the outdoors, whether it's seeing the animals for the first time or hiking the trail, going on a backpacking adventure, or choosing to do this as a career. We've also been able to take advantage of some of the conference room spaces up there and some of the great outdoor instruction space uh, as our as our staff uh, has had a number of retreats up there. If people are interested in utilizing Shavers Creek for those purposes, how would they find information about that? Uh, yeah, right now, uh, the best thing to do is go to our website. Obviously, uh, with COVID, uh, things are operating in a different manner than they usually do. So uh, things are changing quickly. So I would just say go to shaverscreek.org uh, for the latest up-to-date information. But I'd say more broadly, we do have a lot of Penn State uh, organizations that are using it. Uh, a lot of community organizations uh, such as the Master Naturalists and uh, you know, great uh, the State College Bird Club. These are people that we can all connect with, which have a shared uh, vision, and we all can uh, partner together to do better work in our community and in our region. So a number of questions about the lake. Uh, do you still have boating on the lake? Uh, yes, there is boating. Uh, I believe right now that is also uh, currently shut down to COVID. Uh, the boating is actually run by Stone Valley Recreation Area, which is part of Student Affairs. And so I don't want to speak uh, too much for them, but I would recommend going to the Student Affairs website uh, for the most up-to-date information there. Um, we collectively all are on the same 7,000 acres of land along uh, with the Stone Valley Forest. So a lot of the trails are interconnected, uh, but the boats and the cabins are Stone Valley Recreation Area. And someone's asking a question about the regatta that they used to hold out there. Did that completely stop in 1979 is the question. I wish I could uh, speak on the status of the regatta, but I'm not quite sure uh, where that is. I was, uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with it, but it sounds like a right. great opportunity to uh, get some more excitement and involvement on the lake here soon. Absolutely. You mentioned a little bit about how students can volunteer. Can you expand on some of the volunteer opportunities that you have at Shavers Creek? Sure. Uh, yeah, once again, go to our uh, shaverscreek.org uh, website and you can go to the support tab and we have uh, a volunteer intake. And so we really kind of work with two different groups or types of volunteers, uh, group volunteers. Uh, that might be a campus club or uh, it might be somebody from the community. And those are typically folks that might come in to do a specific project like some trail work or um, you know, helping uh, work on the facilities. Those are typically maybe a one or two day event. And then we also offer uh, individual volunteer opportunities and those uh, really are program specific uh, because of the nature of animal care. We have a lot of animals to take care of every day. Uh, we've typically got a handful of volunteers in frequently. Uh, some other programs may be more seasonal, but once again, shaverscreek.org is uh, the best place to find out about opportunities under the support tab. So uh, I wanna ask a couple questions about uh, the pandemic and, and how that has had an impact on Shavers Creek, I also want to talk a little bit about uh, world events and, and how you all are thinking about and talking about that at Shavers Creek. But first, uh, the question from Amy Elliott is, what has been the biggest challenge for the center during the COVID pandemic? 
Well, I think uh, going back to our motto, connecting people to people and people to nature. Um, and, you know, the, one of the ways that we pride ourselves in doing that at Shavers Creek, whether it's physically at the center or in a lot of our academic programs, is, you know, that social interaction in the outdoors, that uh, community learning together uh, in a shared experience. And so uh, I know that's been very challenging. One of the great things about being part of outreach and online education is with the World Campus, Penn State has this amazing institutional knowledge about remote programming. And so fortunately, uh, at least for our academic classes, we were able to pivot mid-semester very successfully uh, to you know, provide some kind of experience. And now with the summer to give us preparation for the fall, uh, we've got the time to be much more deliberate about it and look at some hybrid programming. Um, but uh, for many of us as well, we're also trying to figure out how do we serve our audience. And it's a you know, there's good and bad, and our audience can really expand in a situation like this. We're obviously communicating with people about Shavers Creek that we might not normally do so right now. So I think it's shown us some new opportunities for engaging with uh, for audiences that don't have the opportunity to physically come out, whether that's because of uh, physical means or financial reasons or uh, connect with partners across the country. But uh, it's been a great time because we're in the middle of strategic planning, and so all this stuff is front and center. Uh, Penn State Outreach has just unveiled their strategic plan. And so we can really take all this new information that we have of what the world did look like, what it looks like now, what it could look like uh, to create uh, a better vision for the future, I think. You know, a topic that came up when we were talking, uh, we had a uh, previous virtual speaker series se uh, session on national parks and the topic of diversity, equity and inclusion came up um, and being able to provide those kind of experiences to all audiences that are that are wishing to have those experiences how have those how what do those conversations look like at shavers creek uh it's actually a very pertinent conversation right now um the outdoor recreation and environmental education field is very white and middle class and uh kind of going back to your question about you know threats to wildlife uh we all share this environment we're all part of it uh, regardless of where we live and uh you know I'm fortunate to live in a, and work in a beautiful place, but there are folks that live uh, in urban areas with uh, rivers and uh, that are not in great condition. And those people also deserve uh, to live in a healthy, clean environment that help benefits uh, the economy there with jobs and beautification. And so we need to bring more people to the table. And uh, I think one of the things that's been really great with the animal care program in particular is uh, animals really appeal to all people, whether you're uh, into nature or not. And as a result, uh, we attract uh, folks from a variety of different backgrounds. Um, and people that work with animals uh, also seem to be attracted because animals really don't care what, uh, you know, who your friends are, what you like to do, what you look like. They just really care how you treat them. And so people that have been marginalized, whether it's the LGBT community or people because of their race or ethnicity, uh, they have an opportunity to come here in a safe environment, uh, connect with animals that judge them only by how they are being treated. And so um, it's something as a center we really want to expand and increase to make sure that, once again, these emerging professionals come from all walks of life uh, because uh, biodiversity, uh, there is strength in diversity, uh, both the human communities and natural communities. So I, I don't know if it's, um, if it's that I'm more aware of, of wildlife around me or if there's some sort of impact that COVID-19 has had with people being at home and maybe with a reduction in pollution from uh, people uh, driving a lot less uh, because of the stay at home order. Uh, but, but is it safe to say that we are seeing uh, animals maybe moving uh, more than we might have uh, before March? Um, I know when we go on our, when we go on our, our walks with our dogs, we're seeing more hawks um, we've seen, we've actually seen bear, uh, we've seen turkeys in places where we had never seen turkeys before. Uh, but it, has that been maybe a, a benefit of uh, people staying home and maybe staying off the roads has been, um, we've been seeing a lot more wildlife moving around? I, I've heard that from a lot of folks and uh, I don't know, you know, from an evidence point of view, if that's backed up, but it certainly does seem to make a lot of sense. Uh, anecdotally, being at Shavers Creek early in the spring uh, when uh, things first shut down, we seemed to notice uh, a lot more raptors around the center. Um, I had a couple of birds uh, in some of the marsh areas that may have been there before, but I hadn't heard before uh, because of you know the lack of noise and things. 
Uh, but I think also with this COVID situation, a lot of us have paused to really maybe pay closer attention to what's going on around us as well. So I think, I think it's a, a little bit of both. Um, right now, uh, a lot of animals do have their babies. And so you're more likely to see raccoons early in the morning as they're uh, finishing up feeding from foraging during the night. Um, hawks have fledged the nest. So I can't speak definitively, but it certainly does seem that uh, certainly people are paying more attention and seeing more, which is really a great thing. Absolutely. Uh, Scott Harris would like to know if you have any webcams set up for, for those of us who are further away um, that are linked to what's going on at Shavers Creek. Yeah, that's a great question. We actually have two seasonal webcams. Uh, John Kaufman uh, is our citizen science coordinator, and John has done an excellent job of going out in the community and engaging with farmers in particular. And uh, two of the species that he works with are the American kestrel and barn owl, which also we have uh, represented at Shavers Creek. And so uh, in the spring and into the summer, he does have nest cams on uh, some of those uh, websites uh, on the citizen science page there for Shavers Creek. Um, but we do not currently have any in the enclosures. And that's something we actually have talked about. And uh, right now with the COVID situation, as we think about how to adapt and connect with new audiences, uh, I think that's something we're going to take a closer look at. But thank you, Scott. Appreciate that question. So uh, another thing that I think Shavers Creek is known for is the miles of trails that you have. Um, are, are those trails open to the public? And do they still go all the way around the lake? We're getting a question here. Uh, as a student and as a Sierra Club board member, we used to walk around all the way around the lake. Are you still allowed to hike on those trails and walk around the lake? Yes, uh, right now, even though uh, services aren't fully open because of COVID, the trails are open. Uh, you can still hike around the lake. It's a beautiful uh, walk any season, great way to see seasonal change. Uh, but Stone Valley, once again, which uh, Shavers Creek is part of, has over 20 miles of trails uh, running through a variety of habitats, so stream, uh, of course, the lake, and a variety of forested and some ridge habitats. Uh, just a wonderful place to get out, stretch your legs, uh, maybe see some wildlife and uh, connect uh, with your Pennsylvania uh, ecology. So you have had an experience there. We saw in one of the videos where the Eastern Hellbender was named the uh, Pennsylvania State Amphibian. And, and all of us have seen these growing up, right? For those of us who remember Encyclopedia Britannica and you pull up a state and you see their state bird or their state flower, and some of us have wondered how, what does that process look like? How does a state amphibian become a state amphibian? Can you talk a little bit about what, what was entailed in that process? I'm not familiar with too much of the details, but it was a legislative uh, decision. And I know uh, the hellbender was competing with, I believe it was the green salamander found in Southwest Pennsylvania, uh, which is I believe an endangered species in the state, but uh, often uh, restricted to some of those uh, areas in Laurel Highlands. Uh, but ultimately, I think the hellbender uh, is at least formally more widespread and perhaps more of a charismatic animal based on its size. But um, we were certainly lobbying for it, uh, you know, talking to the general public, and it really lines in uh, with the idea that we want to create awareness of these species, number one, uh, when people come to Shavers Creek, uh, to know that they exist here in Pennsylvania. Uh, so then they can begin appreciating the ecological role of those animals. And then if we do our job well, uh, we're sending them uh, back home to engage in some conservation action or behaviors to support those species. What other advocacy efforts are you all involved in at Shavers Creek? Well, and I should clarify, I said, I said lobby, and we weren't formally lobbying. We're, uh, we're sure, not sure. Al allowed to technically lobby, but... Um, uh, we uh, aren't involved in formal advocacy in those sense. So really, um, like I say, big bucket uh, conservation. So watershed stewardship, uh, ridge top conservation, those are the two big ones for the animal care program. But more holistically, uh, they fit into our general goal of increasing biodiversity uh, as a center. We really want people to learn how to connect uh, with the natural world and live with it in a sustainable way. So ultimately, uh, it's about coexistence and um, I think that's really what we're trying to do. Excellent. A number of people, not necessarily questions, but just comments, uh, talking about um, being out at Shavers Creek and at Stone Valley for orientation and, I'm sorry, orienteering and camping. Uh, Allison uh, writes, I first learned about Shavers Creek and Stone Valley during the Orion first year experience program and backpacking trip was very impressed. Great facility. Thank you for the presentation. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really exciting to 
to hear about you know people's stories and to see all that connection and uh, you mentioned Orion. Orion is part of our Aurora program. Aurora is actually just getting ready uh, to kick off here. Actually, I think it did kick off um, already. But it's a the orient. It's pre uh, first week of college. Or new incoming students typically go backpacking, and obviously this year because of COVID that had to change. But the Aurora staff has come up with an amazing program to get the students uh, engaged virtually, teach them some skills uh, remotely. And so when they do show up here at University Park, they've had a really great way to connect with some of their fellow freshmen and uh, learn a little bit more about being part of this Penn State community. Excellent. Uh, for those of you who are still on Zoom, thank you for your participation. We put all the links that Jason mentioned, uh, whether it was in the videos or uh, has mentioned here live. You can find all of those uh, in the chat box, so make sure you check those out. Jason, thank you for joining us today on the virtual speaker session. Yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity to share Shavers Creek and uh, part of my Penn State experience here. Uh, I haven't been a grad in 1999 and actually prior to that, a volunteer in the animal care program at Shavers Creek. So uh, thank you all for your support of our, the university and for all the work you do in your communities. And thank you all for tuning in. That's all the time that we have. As a reminder, we'll be hosting additional speaker sessions in the coming weeks and months and this programming is in addition to the wide array of networking events and career programs that are available throughout the year, you can view a full listing on our website at alumni.psu.edu slash events. Thank you again, and we are. Penn State. <laughs>